Well, are you glad to be in the Lord's house this morning? Amen. Amen. It's another beautiful day to be able to, uh, to just worship and give praise. And we're going to begin this morning with that awesome chorus, I stand amazed in the presence, how marvelous, how wonderful. And my song shall ever be, I love that word, how marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. And he loves us this morning. And uh, let's just take this time to show our love for him. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and I wonder just how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean sing with me how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall In the garden, he prayed, not my will, but thine. He had no tears for his own griefs, but sweat drops of blood for mine. Let's sing this last stanza together. When with the ransomed in glory His face I at last shall see It will be my joy through the ages To sing of His love for me how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love. Let's pray together, and would you remain standing after prayer, please? Brad, it's good to have you and Ginger back. Would you lead us in prayer at this time, brother? Amen. Well, it's good to see y'all this morning. Hope everyone's doing well. I think our early crowd uh, probably has you beat in attendance this morning. Uh, we had looked like a bigger, larger crowd in the early service, but it's great to see you here, and especially any that may be visiting with us today. If you are visiting this morning and perhaps first-time visitor, let me just extend a warm welcome to you, tell you that you are welcome here. We, um, I'm always excited to see new faces as they come into our services from week to week, 
And I want to just encourage you to do me a favor. If you would, please look in the back of the pew in front of you, and you will find a visitor's card. If you would, please take one and fill it out for us and drop it in the offering plate this morning. We'd appreciate you doing just that, okay? Now that I've welcomed you, I would ask that everybody welcome somebody, okay? Let's sing this chorus together. Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more could he give? Father, we pray one more time to thank you and praise you for this day and for the privilege of being together this morning as a church family to worship you. And Father, I come now to pray for the offering that we are about to receive, that you will bless each giver. And Lord, uh, that you will bless what is given and multiply it and use it for your kingdom's work here in the, through this church and in the community and throughout the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. While the ushers are uh, receiving the offering this morning, let me mention a few things by way of announcements. Uh, just for your information, I baptized two in the early service this morning. Uh, that was uh, Julie Gross and Teresa Couch. Also, let me uh, just share with you that tonight we're going to have a special guest speaker, uh, Warren Maynard, who is Gary Bird's son-in-law. He is a graduate of Southwestern Seminary. Uh, young uh, minister, pastor, he and his wife are moving to Washington and they're going to start a new church plant there in the near future. And so I've invited uh, Warren to come. He's preaching at, uh, at Elkin Valley this morning, but I've invited him to come tonight and share with us about his ministry. And also, as I told the early crowd this morning, if you would please come prepared to give something for a love offering and uh, we can invest something into their lives and in the life of this new church plant and uh, in Washington, and so uh, just come prepared as we receive a love offering for them tonight. Also, you will see a list of items that are needed for Tri-C. Uh, we desperately need to get some of these items in, so if you would, please purchase some of these items, bring them in to the church office, and we'll have someone that will pick them up and take them to uh, Tri-C. And then it's great to have our missions team back with us. Brad and Ginger are here, and then Shane and other team members in the earlier service this morning. And so it's great to have them back. And we're looking forward to hearing what went on uh, during their missions uh, effort uh, overseas. And we're, um, we will be hearing from them next Sunday evening. And we'll be scheduling and planning a, a special service uh, for next Sunday night. So I hope that you will come and be a part of that and pray for them as they put the, everything together. Okay, God bless you. Uh, I think we're going to have some special music now, so y'all come. Lord, I stand in the midst of a multitude of those from every tribe and tongue. We are your people, redeemed by your blood. Rescued from death by your love There are no words good enough to thank you There are no words to 
express my praise but I will lift up my voice and sing from my heart with all of my strength Alleluia 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 to the Lamb Alleluia Alleluia by the blood of Christ we stand every tongue every tribe every people every land giving glory giving honor giving praise unto the Lamb of God Lifted up was He to die It is finished was His cry now favorites hallelujah that is from the musical God for us that uh, we have done here in the past few years let's continue as we sing I'm gonna ask oh, I've got the wrong bulletin I'm gonna ask if you would to uh, turn to number 136 are you washed in the blood of the lamb we'll do the first second and then the last stanzas and then we will uh, go from there to the blood will never lose its power it's number 136 are you washed in the blood Have you been to Jesus for your cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood? In the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the 
blood in the soul cleansing blood of the lamb are your garments spotless are they white as snow are you washed in the blood of the lamb the blood that jesus shed for me way back on calvary the blood that gives me strength from day to day it will never lose its power would you stand please let's do that chorus it reaches to the highest mountain it flows to the lowest valley the blood that gives me strength from day to day it will never lose its power do the chorus the whole chorus one more time it reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley oh the blood that gives me strength from day to day it will never lose its power the last line it will never lose its power amen heavenly father thank you so much for that shed blood on calvary and God, right now, as our pastor comes and speaks to us, Lord, would you just lift him up this morning, give him words to say that you've already placed on his heart that we need to hear. And once again, we thank you for your love by going to the cross for us. And we love you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, my fault. I pulled the battery out to put it in and let it charge a little while and forgot to put it back in. So I'll have to use the pulpit mic this morning, unless you want to send me a battery down. Let's open our Bibles to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2. The Apostle Paul is writing to young Timothy, calling upon him to resist harmful, false teachings and to remain true to that which he had learned from the Apostle Paul. Thank you, brother. Here, beginning in verse 14, Paul is writing to Timothy and saying, I want you to be sound in the faith. And let's begin reading in verse 14. He said, of these things, put them in remembrance. That is, Paul is telling Timothy, he said, the things if you've heard from me, you've seen in my ministry, you've heard from other sources, he said, I want you to put those that you are in charge over I want you to put them in remembrance. He said, charging them to, before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. And then he says to him, study to show thyself approved uh, unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, 
for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, he says in verse 19, and I want you to pay close attention to what he says here in this verse. He says, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. And that word seal signifies a, 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 a mark of authentication uh, and ownership that God has placed uh, on his people, his church. And he says, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, that number one, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and number two, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. What I want you to pay attention to this morning is the last part of verse 19, where he says, let every, listen to this now, let every one that nameth the name of Christ, uh, that word nameth, it can be translated professes, one who professes Christ as Savior. And so he says, let everyone that professes Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they name the name of Christ, they take Christ as their very own. He says, let every one of them depart from iniquity. And that word iniquity in the Greek means unrighteousness. In other words, he's referring to sin. And he's saying that every single person who names the name of Christ should turn away from sin. Whether we realize it or not, those of us who have been saved and, more, and born again have a moral responsibility to, to live a disciplined Christian life. God has called us to a life of discipline. That means that we should discipline ourselves so that God will not have to discipline us. Uh, we're to pay close attention to our own individual spiritual lives. Uh, because God scrutinizes everything that we say, everything that we, we think, everything that we do. He scrutinizes all of those things. And the Bible tells us if we will judge ourselves, then we will not be judged. In other words, if we will scrutinize our own lives and take into, into account all that is going on in our own personal lives, then God will not have to bring discipline on us. And when we stand before the Lord, we'll stand before him with clean hands and a pure heart. The fact is God desires that every single one of his children live a very disciplined life, a life of purity. And we're going to see in this message this morning that the only way that we as God's people can be fit for the master's use is, is to live godly and pure lives. And so this morning as we think about this whole idea of how the, the, the Bible tells us that we as believers need to depart from iniquity, we do not need to live in unrighteousness, but we need to live pure and righteous lives. I want us to see three things this morning. First of all, I want to talk a little bit about the problem of sin or the problem that we all have with sin. You, buy, you see, the Bible tells us that sin is a universal problem. It is a problem with all people. The Bible tells us in the book of Romans that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none good, no, not one. That means that every single one of us who are here this morning, we were all born into sin. Every single person on the face of this earth is a sinner. They are, we are all sinners by nature, and we are sinners by choice before we come to know Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. And so we can't get around the fact that we're all sinners. But when we're saved and we're born again, the Bible tells us that God, through Jesus Christ his Son, took care of the sin problem. And he sent Jesus to die on the cross for us. And so when Jesus died on the cross, God the Father laid on Jesus all the sins of all the world for all time so that Jesus dealt a death blow to sin once and forever and so that we should not be dominated by sin. Paul said in the book of Romans that sin shall not have dominion over God's children. 
And so uh, God the Father dealt with the sin problem through Jesus Christ dying on the cross in our place. And so when we're born again and we're saved by the grace and the goodness of God, and I'm going to share a little bit about the process and what takes place when that happens in a few minutes. But, but when we're saved and we're born again, then that sin problem is, is taken care of. But after we're saved, then we know we still commit sin. We don't habitually commit sin. But there are acts of sin. There are times when you and I fall short and, and we sin against God. And when we do, the Bible says in, in 1 John chapter, chapter 2 and verses 1 and 2 that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins and not for our sins only, not for only our sins, but for the sins of all the world. And so God has made a way that sin can be dealt with. But when we're saved and we're born again, I want you to understand that we still have a sin problem and we need to deal with those sins in our life when they come to our lives. Because you see, the problem with sin is, number one, sin contaminates. And I want you to listen to me carefully. I'm speaking primarily to Christians this morning, uh, those of you who know the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as to those who may be here or who may listen to this message that have never been saved. But I want you to understand that the problem with sin is, number one, it contaminates. That means it literally defiles a person's life. It, it, uh, it makes one impure. That means it makes a believer impure. Even after we're saved, sin can still contaminate our life and make us impure. It can defile us and can um, rob us of so many different things in our life. And so sin contaminates the life. That's why uh, David, King David cried out in Psalm uh, 51 after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba and had her husband Uriah killed. And David's life was, was, was filled with guilt and shame. And he toted that guilt and shame around for approximately one year before God sent Nathan the prophet to David to confront him with his sin. And when Nathan confronted David with his sin, David began to confess to God. And Psalm 51 was written by David about the time that Nathan the prophet came to him and confronted him about his sin. And in that, in that psalm, in Psalm 51 and verse 10, David cried out and said, Oh God, create in me a clean heart. Why is that? Because sin had contaminated his life. Sin had defiled him. Sin had caused him to feel impure. That's what happens. Even the believer, when sin enters the life, and so sin contaminates, but secondly, I want you to understand, sin separates. Sin not only contaminates, but sin separates. The Bible tells us that, that uh, sin separates any person from God. I believe it even separates a person, a Christian person from God after a person has been saved and born again in that, listen to me carefully, in that it breaks our fellowship. Our relationship isn't broken, but our fellowship is broken. Our communion with him, our intimacy with him is broken. That's why John tells us in the book of First John, and uh, I want to go there and read just a few verses in First John chapter 1 and verse 5. Listen to what John wrote there. He said, This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light. That word light denotes purity, holiness. God is holy. God is pure. There's no sin in him. He is a holy and pure God. And so it, it, it says that he is light and in him, that is in God, is no darkness at all. Darkness represents sin. And he said there's no darkness at all. If we say, that is, if we believers say that we have fellowship with him, and notice that word fellowship, it is the Greek word koinonia, and it means companionship, it means togetherness, it means, it, it denotes the intimacy that we have with God. He says if we say, if we Christians say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, that is we have unconfessed sin in our life, and we're not confessing that sin on a regular basis to God, he said, and we walk in darkness, he said, then we lie and we do not the truth. We're lying to ourselves, we're lying to God, we're lying to the world. He said, we lie and do not the truth. But if we as believers walk in the light as he, God, is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another. That is, the believer has fellowship with God. God has fellowship with the believer. And he said, in the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. And so you see, that fellowship is broken. That's how sin not only contaminates, but sin separates or breaks a believer's fellowship with God. But I want to suggest to you thirdly that not only does sin contaminate and not only does sin separate, but sin disqualifies a believer for service. And what I, mean, what I mean by that is simply this. It renders a believer unfit for use. 
I want to ask you a question. If I lived as your pastor, if I lived a life of the devil every day, and I stood in this pulpit and tried to proclaim the word of God to you, would you come and listen to me? Why? Because you would see me as being unfit to stand in this place. You see what I'm saying? And my dear brethren, listen to me. The same applies to your life as well as mine. We are called on by God to live disciplined lives, to depart from iniquity, to deal with sin, to separate ourselves from anything or anyone that would cause us to, to sin against Almighty God because sin contaminates our life, it breaks our fellowship, separates us from God, and it disqualifies us for service. Therefore, I, surrender to, I submit to you this morning that we need to deal with sin, and that's what John said there in 1 John in chapter 1. He said very clearly there in that passage as, as we go on and continue to read I read down uh, verses 5 through 7 now verses 8 through 10 he says if we as, if we as believers say that we have no sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us but if we confess our sins he God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we say that we have not sinned we make him a liar and his word is not in us my little children these things write unto you that ye sin not and if any man sin sin we have an advocate with the father Jesus Christ the righteous and he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world and so John tells us how that believers need to deal with sin through repentance and confession and acceptance of forgiveness based on the authority of God's word and the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross on our behalf and so, that's the problem that we have with sin. Now, as we continue to think about this whole idea of departing from iniquity, I want you to understand that when we begin to depart from iniquity or turn from sin, that gives indisputable evidence and proof that we have a true conversion experience. Because, you see, here's what happens. Now, let me give you a little process that we go through and what happens when a person is saved and born again. And again, this gives evidence of a true conversion, and I'm going to show you why in just a moment. But number one, when a person experiences the new birth, the first thing that happens is there is a deposit of the Spirit. That is, God deposits the Holy Spirit of God into the heart and life, the body, if you please, of every single person that calls upon the name of Jesus Christ for salvation and is born from above. God deposits His Spirit in a person. And when the Spirit of God is placed in a person's body, in a person's heart, then what happens? That person receives the very nature of God. And what did we say about God a few moments ago? That God is light. He is holy. He is pure. There is no sin at all in Him. He cannot sin because he is God. So that stands to reason that if God deposits his spirit into our life and we have the Holy Spirit of God living on the inside of us, that tells me, listen, that he is there for a purpose. He is there to give us God's divine nature so that that divine nature living on the inside of us will help us and give us the strength and the power that we need to overcome sin and to depart from, the, from habitually living in sin. That's what makes all the difference between a lost person and a saved person is that the lost person does not possess the Spirit of God, whereas the saved person literally possesses the Holy Spirit of God. You say, can you prove that by Scripture? Yes, I can. For example, in 1 Corinthians in chapter 6, listen to what Paul said. He said, beginning in verse 18, he said, flee fornication. He said, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. And then he says in verse 19, what? Know ye not that your body, now remember, he's writing to Christians, and he's saying, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? The body becomes the temple, the, the house, if you please, of the Holy Spirit of God at the moment of salvation and conversion. So he says that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And how do we do that? By living a, a, a Christian life. 
by allowing God to conform us to the very image of Jesus' Son and to become like Jesus Christ, living a pure and godly life. And so, first of all, when a person is saved, there is that deposit of the Spirit which gives the divine nature. Secondly, there is a desire for purity. Not only is there a deposit of the Spirit, but there is a desire for purity. Think about this. God's nature who lives on the inside of every single Christian is the one that gives that Christian the desire to live a life of godliness and holiness. It would be contrary to God's Spirit for a Christian to want to live any other kind of life. Now, mind you, a Christian can choose to sin. But the Spirit of God who lives in the Christian is the one that gives the desire to live holy. And so we seek that holiness. We have a desire for purity. Uh, listen, I don't know of anything that disturbs me any more than to, than, than, than to commit some sin. And, and, and what happens is there is an alarm that goes off inside me. And that alarm number is twofold. It, number one is my conscience. God has placed that alarm in every single person. Yes, everyone here this morning has that alarm system built into your life. It is called the conscience. And when, the, and when we do something wrong against someone else or against ourselves or against God, our conscience will, will uh, make us aware of that. And that alarm will go off and we will sense guilt and shame and, and rightly so. I mean, thank God for conscience. But not only is conscience there, the Holy Spirit is there. And the Holy Spirit will also warn us and there will be an alarm that will go off in the conscience and the Holy Spirit will use the conscience in the heart and, and, and in our mind and He will set that alarm off and help us to know, oh, we've done something against God and nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing will take the place of humbling yourself before my Almighty God and confessing that to the Lord and getting that right with Him so that you can be cleansed from that sin and the guilt that so, that so easily besets us sometimes because we, we harbor those things and oftentimes we don't want to confess them. And yet confession is the, the one means by which God is intended for us to get rid of all of those, those feelings. And so there's that deposit of the Spirit, and then there's the desire for purity. And thirdly, there is a departure from iniquity. There will be a departure from iniquity. That's why Paul wrote what he did here, depart from iniquity. Everyone that nameth the name of Christ, depart from iniquity. There will be that desire because of that deposit of the Spirit. And, and this is what repentance is all, all about, turning from sin. You see, now listen to me carefully. A person who truly knows Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior will not, I repeat, will not continually, habitually live in sin. I want you to listen at the Word of God. In 1 John, back over to that little book, 1 John, I want you to listen to what John wrote there uh, in chapter 3. He begins, in, let me begin in verse 1. He says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we, Christians, should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he, Christ, shall appear, in other words, when he comes back, we, believers, shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now listen at verse 3. And every man, every person that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, purges himself, herself, even as he is pure. In other words, we'll depart from sin. We'll get away from anything. If we know that Christ is coming back, we're going to be doing everything that we can to live a holy and pure life before him. Now listen to what he says beginning in verse 4. Whosoever, that includes every person, committeth sin, and that word committeth means abides in sin. In other words, it could read whosoever abides in sin. To abide means that you stay there, okay? You're in sin every day. Whosoever committeth or abideth in sin transgresseth also the law, for the law, for the sin is the transgression of the law. And you know that he, Christ, was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him, that is, the person that is, that is abiding in Christ, living in him, 
day after day on a regular basis, walking with him, walking in obedience to his word and his will. He said, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Now, in the Greek, that means to no longer practice sin. There's a difference between sinning occasionally and sinning habitually. And that's what he's talking about here is sinning habitually. Not an occasional sin, but sinning on a regular basis. That's your lifestyle. That's the way you live every day. And he said, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. In other words, you don't have a relationship with Christ. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he, God, is righteous. He that committed sin, he that continually practices sin, is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God, are you listening now? Whosoever has experienced the new birth, has the Holy Spirit living on the inside of them, he says, doth not continually practice sin. For why? For his seed, that is God's seed. And what is the seed? The seed is the Spirit of God, and the seed is the Word of God. He says, God's seed remaineth in him. That speaks a word about eternal security. It says, God's seed, his Spirit and his Word remaineth in him. And he cannot sin. He cannot habitually practice sin because he or she is born of God. And so you see, that's, that's the whole point that I'm trying to make is that sin, I mean, uh, departing from sin or turning from sin gives evidence of a true conversion. Because the Holy Spirit is deposited into the life of the person, there is a desire for purity from the Spirit, there is a departure from iniquity, and then, listen to this, there is a delight in conformity. There is a delight in conformity. You say, what do you mean? I mean that when you and I begin to conform our lives to the very image of Jesus Christ and we conform our lives to the standard by which God has set for you and for me to live, and that is that, again, that we, we have a moral, listen, we're living a moral and a disciplined life, confessing our sins, uh, not committing sin habitually or continually, but occasionally we may mess up, and when we do, we confess those sins to God. We receive God's forgiveness. He says, listen, then there is a delight into that, in that conformity. We delight, there is joy when we comply to the standards of God and we know that our conscience is clear, our heart is pure, and there's nothing between us and God. I think that's why David cried out in Psalm 32. Psalm 32 is a sequel to uh, uh, Psalm 51. And, he, and, and day, here in this psalm, David cries out after he has been forgiven of his sin. And he says in verse 1, blessed. That word blessed in the Hebrew means happy. Happy is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. And then he says in verse 2, happy, blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity and who, in whose spirit there is no guile. That's why David rejoiced because his sin had been forgiven. Listen, there was that delight in conforming to the standard of God. And that is when you have sin in your life, get rid of it. Do anything and everything you can to get rid of sin and to remain pure before holy God. There's a second thing, and I must hurry, and that is this, that turning from sin, turning from sin is essential for usefulness. It is, it is essential for usefulness. Look at what he says in our text, verses 20 and 21. He says, but in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself of these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Now, I want you to notice that Paul uses an interesting illustration here in these verses, in verse 20, uh, to describe the condition of the church. He compared the church to... a a, a, a rich homeowner whose home is filled with various sorts of vessels. Some containers are made out of gold and some are made out of silver and some are made out of wood and, and, and he says uh, some are made out of earth, clay. 
And, and he compares the church to, to, to that. And he says that the church is the same way. Inside the church house, all those inside the church are seen of God as being vessels. Some are vessels of honor and some are vessels of dishonor. Some vessels who are vessels of honor are those who can be used of God. For he goes on to say in verse 21, If a man therefore purge himself, purge himself, drawing away from sin and drawing to God, departing from iniquity, if a, if a Christian will, will purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, listen to this, and meet for the master's use. That word meet means fit. And so he says, very simply here that, that turning from sin is essential for one's usefulness. Now, let me share four things with you quickly in closing. Number one, God desires to use every vessel. Out of all the vessels in the church, God desires to use every single vessel. All believers have some use. Did you know that? That if you're a Christian this morning and you're a member of this fellowship or a member of some other fellowship, I want you to understand that God has saved you and called you and you have some use. Every Christian has some use. Secondly, I want you to notice that every vessel is not usable. And the reason for that is because we limit our own usefulness. A Christian can limit his usefulness by God. We limit our usefulness by the level of our conviction and our, listen, and our consecration to God, how we keep ourselves pure before the Lord. Every vessel is not usable because every vessel is not pure before God. And, and, a, and a vessel that is not pure before Him becomes a vessel of dishonor. Thirdly, I want you to notice that every vessel's use is determined by purity. Our use is determined by purity. We must keep ourselves pure and find the purity qualifies for use. Basically saying the same thing, but purity qualifies for use. He says very clearly that we will be sanctified if we will purge ourselves, if we will depart from iniquity and keep sin out of our life and remain pure before the Lord. We will be vessels unto honor, sanctified, set apart, and fit for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. You know, I was thinking this morning about how many people are in the church today who are saved, but because they're not living pure lives before the Lord, keeping their sins confessed, harboring little things. You see, it's possible for a person to harbor some sin that we consider to be some little sin and not confess it. And when we do that, we, we begin to harbor that and we don't confess it to God, then we can't be useful to God. That sin contaminates us, breaks our fellowship. That's what happens oftentimes to Christian people there. And, and, and they stay in that condition for so long that God, He, he does this. He takes that vessel and he puts it on a shelf. That vessel is no longer usable. I want to tell you, folks, I hope and pray to God that I never do anything to cause God to have to put me on a shelf and leave me on some shelf somewhere over here because I'm not fit for his kingdom's work. I've always had a horror. I mean, literally, I've, I've always been terrified of allowing anything to enter into my life or to do anything that would, that, would, that would, listen, somehow disqualify me from ministry. And there, there are people today, there are men of God today who have been disqualified and they're no longer in the ministry because of their sinful lifestyles. And, and somehow we, the church, have blown that up to such proportions that the church members themselves forget that this applies to them as well. Every one of you who are sitting here this morning under the sound of my voice, who name the name of Christ, who know the Lord Jesus Christ, I want you to know that this, what I'm sharing with you is applicable to your life, every single one of you. And if every single one of us, if we do not withdraw ourselves from anything or anyone that would 
seduce us and tempt us and keep us away from holiness and purity and, and keep us away from, from those things that would hinder us and causing us to be effective in the ministry of Christ. Listen, we're headed, we're headed for trouble. But people are so prone to harbor sin. You show me a person that is harboring sin in his heart or her heart and I'll show you a person that cannot be used to their full potential by God because of what sin does. And I would pray that every member of every body of Christ scattered throughout the world would, 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 would come to understand and realize that, that every single person has to live a pure and holy life. Do we struggle? Yes, we struggle. I struggle just like you do. I'm a human being just like you are. I struggle with thoughts. I struggle with anger. I struggle with a lot of different things in my life. But I, through the power of the Holy Spirit, I, when I know that I've done something wrong and my conscience can, it, it, it is, is, listen, sends that alarm, that alarm goes off in my conscience and the Holy Spirit convicts me. Listen, I'm so prone and so quick to confess that to God because I don't want anything to hinder me from being what I need to be. I don't know if that's important to you or not, but it's important to me, and I would hope it's important to you. And that's why Paul was saying to young Timothy, Timothy, whatever you do, son, depart from iniquity. Don't let, don't let iniquity be in your life. It'll render you ineffective. It'll disqualify you for the race. Just, don't, just always depart from iniquity and live a pure and a holy life. And those that are not saved and born again by the Spirit of God, they can be forgiven and cleansed and have a holy and a pure life no matter what they've done in the past. All they need to do is, is believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of Almighty God and that God sent Him out of His great love uh, to the cross to die for them in, in their place. And He took upon, listen, Himself, their sins and died in their place. And He was buried and He rose again the third day and He lives forevermore. And if a lost person will believe that and embrace that and call out in desperation being willing to repent of their sin and, get, and purge themselves from anything in their life that they know would not be pleasing to God and be willing to cry out to God and through a prayer of desperation and commit their life to God because salvation is more than just praying some prayer. Did you hear me? Salvation is more than, you enter salvation by doing more than just praying a prayer. You commit your life to God. Somehow, I think, I, I know I've been guilty of not stressing that enough that we say, oh, you just pray this prayer and you'll get saved. But listen, there's more to, there's more to, the, the, it's to entering into salvation than just that. One, yes, one must, I believe, call upon the name of the Lord from their heart and call out and ask God to save them. But listen, it is more than that. It is a commitment, a lifelong commitment to Christ, not only as one's Savior, but one's Lord. Jesus is already Lord. He's been declared Lord. And when you receive Him as your Savior, you automatically receive Him as Lord. And you need, to, you need to realize that and commit your life totally and fully surrender everything to Him. I was visiting with someone this last week and I was talking to them about their relationship with the Lord. And that person confessed to me and said, You know, preacher, I, I believe that I'm saved. But through the years, somehow, I've reneged on God and I've with withheld things from God and, and you know right now at this moment in my life I am not fully surrendered to God my, my heart is not fully surrendered to Him you see the inner salvation one must fully surrender one's heart and life to God to Jesus Christ and receive Him as their personal Lord and Savior through repentance and faith and when a person does that the Bible says they'll be saved and born again, the Holy Spirit of God will come in and cleanse from all sin and make them brand new creatures in Christ. What a wonderful experience that is. Have you had that experience? Paul said to young Timothy, Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ Depart from iniquity. Are you doing that? Are we doing that?
God knows. And we know. If we're not living the way we should live, what will we do about it? We need to make some adjustments, will we? Will we adjust our lives to God's standard and depart from iniquity, deal with sin, and live in holiness? Or will we continue on living the way we're living, harboring sin, missing out on God's best, and missing out on being used? by God to our fullest potential. Pray with me. Father, thank you for the opportunity to share your word. Pray you'll bless the invitation now. If there's someone here lost without Jesus, I pray they'll be saved. If there's a Christian here today that is harboring some sin, they know it's sin. Their conscience tells them it's sin. The Holy Spirit tells them it is sin. The Word of God tells them it is sin. Lord, I pray they'll confess it. They will deal with it right here today. So, Lord, I pray, have your way in all of our hearts. Speak to us and help us to be obedient to what you say. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Come every soul by sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord, and He will surely give you rest by trusting. Save you, he will save.